So I want to go over a, an overview of the vaccine strategies. I do want to go back to the endemic coronaviruses and the other two big coronavirus outbreaks from many years ago, because I think it's important to understand a little bit about them to understand how we could catapult so quickly forward into the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Dating back to a very long time ago, there were a series of pandemics. Some of the most notable ones like Black Death and Bubonic Plague had killed 200 million. Smallpox was you know, 50 million. This big blob here was the Spanish flu and that ended up killing 40 to 50 million. Then there's this one, HIV have no vaccine for it. So it's still an ongoing pandemic. And so far it's taken about 35 million um, lives, but here's COVID. So this is the R naught. So this is how many people you infect when you get infected. And you know, here we have measles, which is one of the most contagious infections we've ever faced, where basically if one person gets it, every person around get it because it's on those little air particles. It's highly, highly infectious and it has an R naught of 16. Yet we made a vaccine and, and whomped it, right? Here we have smallpox, an R naught of six. You know, not as bad as measles, but still bad. And then we have all of these. And then here's COVID. And right now, the current R0 is actually much lower than 2.5. This was a slide that was made at the beginning of it. It's probably one some. So we have a virus that's not nearly as infectious as the measles. I think it's important to think about this as we, you know, look at the pandemic. A vaccine needs to induce a response that rids the virus. But in most cases, the main source of the response that you want is going to be these neutralizing antibodies that bind to the surface of the virus inside your body and prevent it from infecting the cells. And in this case, we think it's mainly the cells of the lung epithelia and maybe in the GI tract. So the goal would be to immunize a person and get these neutralizing antibodies so that if you get infected with the virus, these antibodies bind to the virus and you never get sick because it can internalize into cells of the body. Most of these vaccines are immunizing with the spike protein. So the spike protein gets into the body and then the antigen presenting cells that are constantly circulating, surveilling the body, looking for antigens. So when they find pieces of the virus, they can process and present small little regions of the viral protein, so the SARS-CoV-2 protein, in the context of those MHC molecules, that is what is recognized by the T cells. T cells are gonna get activated. You're ultimately gonna make those helper CD4 T cells that help the immune response. At the same time, you will have B cells that will have a B cell receptor, so a different kind of receptor, the antibody receptor on the cell surface. They will also take up that virus when they can recognize it. They'll get activated and because the T cells have also been activated, they will help the B cells and the B cells will be able to go on to become the right kind of B cell that makes tons of these antibodies. So the ultimate goal is to really make these neutralizing antibodies. The other arm of this T cell response that's activated are the CD8 T cells. These are the T cells that go around the body and find virally infected cells and directly kill them. Although we aim for this arm of the immune response when we do most vaccinations, Obviously, also stimulating an effective CD8 T cell response is never going to hurt anything. And, and some, of the, some of the vaccines have the potential to do that. But I do think it's important to point out that we have to make this vaccine without causing something that is called enhancement of viral infection. So there is a possibility when you make these antibodies or you make an immune response to the virus, that when you get infected by the virus, you can increase pathogenicity of the virus. Although there's likely many mechanisms that this can happen by, one of the main ones is that you now have all these antibodies floating around. Antibodies can bind to the surface of various cells. Here we have an antigen presenting cell via specific receptors. In this case, it's the FC receptor. The idea is, is that these receptors bind the antibody bound to the virus and internalize it. A couple of years ago, there was a, a dengue vaccine that was used in the Philippines. And dengue is called breakbone fever. It's just one of the most painful diseases you can ever get. In a place where the virus is endemic, you have two pools of kids. You have the kids that have had the virus before and the kids that have it. 
they put this vaccine into the kids. So what happened in those kids that hadn't been infected previously when they gave them this vaccine, when they got infected with dengue and they had this really, really severe infection in which the virus was internalized very efficiently. And this is something we have to think about, hope that we learn from our past mistakes and are a little bit more careful about this. There is no vaccine that is 100% safe. You know, given that we have to give this vaccine to basically everybody in the world, there will be people that have adverse effects. So what we're going to need are multiple vaccines so we can sort of minimize these secondary effects, um, which can be quite severe. Protein-based vaccines. So these are proteins from the virus. You take the protein, you put them into an adjuvant, and an adjuvant is something that helps to stimulate an immune response. There's something called virus-like particles. So you can make these lipid membranes that look like a virus, and then you put the um, proteins from the virus that you're gonna inject, so you're presenting it to the body the way it actually looks on the surface of the virus. And then there's old tried and true, the virus-based vaccines, and they come in two flavors. One is inactivated. So basically you completely kill the virus before you put it in. These are actually some of the best vaccines we have. There's also live attenuated viruses. So you take the virus and you grow it in vitro to try to make it so that it maintains infectivity, but it's no longer pathogenic. That can take years and always be a little bit dangerous, but it is a very effective approach. And then here we get into the new ones, nucleic acid-based vaccines. So they come in two flavors, mRNA and DNA. And then down here are the viral vectors. And the basic idea behind a viral vector is you take another virus, and we know a lot about this virus. So you insert the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein into this viral vector, and you use it as a mechanism to present the protein to the immune system in the context of a virus. The mRNA vaccines that we've all heard a lot about in the news are what are called these non-replicating mRNAs. So what is meant by that is you just have a piece of RNA that has all of its regulatory units right on it. They encapsulate it in what are called lipid-like nanoparticles. These viral particles can basically melt into the membrane and be internalized into the cells. So that's how these RNA vaccines get in. The RNA gets in, it gets translated, makes the protein, the protein will in many cases be intracellular, you'll get peptide presentation, and some of the protein will get out and you'll drive an antibody response. So the cooler RNAs, I think, are what are called these self-amplifying RNAs or SAMs. Um, they tend to be a little bit longer because you have to have the machinery encoded in the RNA that allows for the RNA to replicate inside the cells. They too are encapsulated via these lipid nanoparticles. They get into the cells, but now the, the RNA is released and because it's self-amplifying, it, it makes its proteins it needs to make more copies of it. So you go from one virus mRNA to a bunch of them. So what this means is you get a lot more protein made by these self-amplifying RNA. The peak protein expression for an mRNA vaccine is one day of the non-replicating type. So you put it in, it's basically, you get one shot at making a ton of protein and you're done. It takes seven to 10 days for an adaptive immune response to start happening. These self-amplifying RNA vectors, you know, give you peak protein expression at seven days. So there's SARS-CoV-1 in 2003, mainly in Asia, and then this MERS, the camel-based one, which was is in mainly in I think Saudi Arabia, but other um, Middle Eastern countries in 2012. So these are both coronaviruses, and you, there was a lot of work done on these on vaccines for these. There's using animal models. There were several vaccines for SARS-CoV-1 developed and tested. So and they used these various different versions of, of viruses that I've already talked about. So there were protein-based vaccines tested, attenuated and whole inactivated viruses. So for SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, we're able to get the attenuated viruses, and then they also used vectors, so viral vectors, DNA, RNA. What they found is most of the vaccines protected the animals from challenging, specifically with SARS-CoV-1, but many did not induce sterilizing immunity. So what is meant by that? They didn't produce the right antibody response to coat the virus and prevent it from infecting. But nevertheless, they, they did make responses, and I think that's important. And perhaps more importantly is they did a non-human primate study, so that's the closest we can get to a human without actually putting it in humans. 
And before SARS-CoV-2, we would have had to have data such as this to actually even go into humans. But we're these are some of the um, things we're letting go a little bit on on how much data you have to go before you go to phase one um, and into humans. So they did do what I think is pretty much a gold standard non-human primate study with inactivated SARS-CoV-1. And when they rechallenged, they had greater survival, reduced viral titers, and or less morbidity. I think one of nine monkeys died. It really helps. That's how vaccination works, right? We do a little bit of similar things with MERS. So we're in, in, mainly in animals. SARS-CoV-1 actually went to phase one trials. The vaccines did. There was only a few because it petered out really quickly. SARS-CoV-2 was incredibly um, deadly and unlike SARS-CoV-2, you knew if you had, you were infectious when you had symptoms. And so it was much easier to contain and it really, you know, it, it would died out. And so they tested an inactivated virus vaccine and it was pretty big and the spike-based DNA vaccine. And both of them were safe and in induced neutralizing antibody titers. I'm telling you this because when we went into the vaccination, this was the data we had that says, yes, we can go right to humans. Um, so we, we learned from the two pathogenic coronavirus outbreaks, but we also know a little bit about the endemic coronavirus. There's four endemic coronavirus that circulate around. All of us have, have very likely had at least one or more of them as an infection. So there's two alpha viruses, two beta viruses. And here I'm showing a paper from 2014 that looked at kids in Colorado and they just asked what happens to these viruses when they had a pretty big sample. And so any kid that was sick and they sent for testing, they also did the PCR for the different viruses. And, and what you can see is that in 2009, there's a huge spike of it, then it dies down. So these endemic viruses are very, very seasonal. So they show up like the flu and then they disappear. But the other thing that I think is really interesting that doesn't get enough attention is that there's a huge spike of OC43. And then the next season, it's there, but it's much reduced and more reduced. And then it kind of comes back. And if you look at all of these viruses, they kind of do this pattern where one is big, one bigger, because they're not, you know, they only account for a total of about 14, 15% of the overall respiratory viruses in a given year. So they're not the huge cause of, you know, the things that we call colds, but they're definitely there. But they cycle and they cycle in a way that suggests our bodies are making some sort of immune response to them. It's almost as if our one year one is prevalent. We kind of make a response to it, or a lot of us do. And then it dies down the next year. Our response dies and it comes back. So this is likely what's going to happen to um, SARS-CoV-2. Here we have the different types of vaccines I've talked about, RNA, DNA, synucleic acid, subunit, virus-like particles, inactivated virus, non-replicating viral vectors, and then we go into the things that replicate. Generian are when you use another virus to vaccinate against the virus. So this would be cowpox for smallpox, and then the live attenuated. And as you go up this category, the efficacy is, is thought to increase. The live attenuated always work the best because the virus that you need to make the immune response to is presented in the most native form. As you go up in efficacy, safety goes down, right? The most dangerous are the replicating viruses. Normally it takes us about 20 years to make a vaccine because a lot of these steps take a lot of time. How do we do this as quick as we need to do? We collapse these all on themselves. You know, they're allowing phase two trials to start before the phase one is completed, but with data that says it's likely to be good. That doesn't mean that phase one won't be completed. We absolutely have to do phase one, phase two, phase three, because we can't vaccinate with something we don't know is safe. And the more important part is that we've got to bring the manufacturer down here where companies are making plants to, to make RNA vaccines, to make DNA vaccines, to make you know, the viral based vectors. That's all happening now as we're sitting here before we have, before we know which candidates are going to be the final vaccines. And I think ideally and, and most optimistically, it's not going to be vaccine, it's going to be vaccines because there's not a single one type of vaccine that we can make to vaccinate everybody. But if we use different pools of these vaccines in a very strategic way, we'll get there.